Hello, good morning, thank you for having me. I'm a general cardiology fellow down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And I think compared to the other cases we have going on, mine's gonna be a little bit different approach that the patient originally was not in shock, but we caused some issues and hopefully that's where we can have a point of discussion is kind of the troubleshooting that we had with the Impella case. So this is an 83-year-old female, past medical history of CAD. She underwent two-vessel cabbage in 2015. At the same time, she underwent placement of a bioprosthetic aortic and mitral valve as she was noted to have severe stenosis on preoperative echo at that time. She also has a past medical history as noted below, but right lacunar CVA, residual hemiparesis, although very functional despite her age, type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease stage 3, as well as some carotid stenosis. She came into our facility with uh, complaints of generalized weakness and a ground level fall after uh, getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. She was also noticed on review of systems to have some progressive dyspnea on exertion over the past five, six days. Initial lab work revealed that she had elevated troponin 1.5 up to a max of two, as well as an EKG with some changes of T-wave inversions in the anterior lateral region. NT ProBMP was of course drawn due to her dyspnea on exertion is markedly elevated and chest x-ray was consistent with CHF. So with the house staff, they initially placed her on ACS protocol. Here's her initial echo, and we see that the uh, ejection fraction is decent. We estimated there's about 40, 45%. We do see some changes there of the mitral valve, but overall with the uh, velocities there and the sizing of the aortic and the mitral valve, there was no significant stenosis or regurgitation of either valves. So this is uh, left heart catheterization, and you see here that this is the four French catheter system. She did have some dampening. Let me see if I can get it to play again. She did have some dampening with even the four French catheter. It was placed in the left main. We see that the ostium of the left main uh, does uh, have some significant narrowing there. It actually appears smaller than the uh, left anterior descending in some views. She also has some mild to moderate disease of the LED itself, as well as left circumflex disease. And in terms of the RCA, just mild disease there. Now, when we take a look at her bypass graphs, we see that the one vein graft uh, down to the obtuse mar marginal, you see at the proximal portion, there is some significant disease there. Let me get it to play again. We estimated that to be about 95 to 99%. And unfortunately, when we take a look at the lima, it is atretic and pretty much useless for this patient. So then it came to the management of this patient. What do we do when she's got severe uh, native vessel uh, disease? Really, the only functional um, vessel is the uh, RCA that was only mild disease there. EF is a little bit borderline, but it is depressed, 40, 45%. And she, overall, given her comorbidities, as discussed below, she does have a high STS score at 14%. More so than the objective data, the patient and the family did not want to undergo another uh, operation. So the, the decision was uh, to undergo high-risk PCI with impella support after discussing with her regular cardiologist as well as the surgeon. The the plan um, with doing the impella was that we saw that the left main was a significant disease there and we wanted, we thought she would need some uh, atherectomy as well as we wanted to go after that vein graft. Now the problem we had with the impella and you see here in this video is we're uh, advancing the impella uh, more into the LV. The reason is, is because we were having a lot of difficulties uh, in um, her blood pressure as well as just overall tolerating. When she started the procedure, her blood pressure was systolic 100 to 110, but after we placed the impella, it kind of slowly progressively started to decline, even to the point where it got, that got, got down into the 40s. But even before it got down that low, we were getting a lot of alarms on the impella about positioning. Well, you see here that with the aortic valve prosthesis, we can, with pretty good confidence, tell um, that we are beyond the valve in terms of looking at the pressure sensors. And so we really weren't sure um, how to uh, troubleshoot this given the issues we were having. Um, she became tachycardic, lots of chest pain, she felt like she could not breathe, and of course the blood pressure went down to the 40s despite um, using dobutamine at 20 mics. And so unfortunately we did have to um, terminate the procedure, and as we took out the uh, impella into the aorta over the next 10 to 15 minutes, she did seem to recover her blood pressure and get a little bit better, although she remained quite symptomatic in terms of the shortness of breath, chest pain, she could not lie still, and so we ultimately had to uh, abort the procedure. In terms of by that time she had already received heparin, we wanted to make sure that with the tachycardia and the hypotension she was not having uh, tamponade, and we see her on the M mode on the left, as well as some subcostal views that were done very quickly. Her EF is decent and there's no evidence of uh, tamponade physiology and no evidence of pericardial effusion there. 
hospital course. Very briefly, she did un um, have a prolonged ICU stay as well as hospitalization stay. She needed um, to undergo open cabbage, which she did well, aside from some kidney issues postoperatively, did not require hemodialysis, but prolonged debutamine and Lasix infusions. Eventually, was, she was just recently discharged to inpatient rehab. But the discussion with the impella in terms of looking at in hindsight, um, trying to troubleshoot, you know, did we use this in the right patient selection? Um, she did have borderline EF, and uh, she did have multivessel disease, and we were planning on doing atherectomy. We actually, during the case, we did do an IFR of the LAD and the uh, left main, and it was significant with the prox LAD of 0 0.48 and the left main 0 0.74 before we had even placed the impella. So we feel we did have good patient selection there. We actually weren't anticipating these type of uh, complications. Potential complications with this patient, we did rule out that she had any tamponade physiology with pericardial effusion. Um, prior to the procedure, we did have an echo that showed she did not have any significant uh, regurgitation or stenosis of the aortic valve that would preclude use of this, no evidence of LV thrombus. So the next thing we come to is positioning. So what we see in the bottom right-hand corner, I'm sure we're all familiar with, is what um, we're looking at in terms of the motor current and placement current. So this is what we'd expect to see in terms of the red showing aortic placement here, and then the motor current, we see that it's pulsatile. Well, what we were seeing in our case was more similar to this one, where we had a flat motor current. And so what that tells us is that both pressure sensors are either in the LV, the AO, or somewhere in the inlet. But like I said previously, we saw in the image, it was very clear where her aortic valve prosthesis was. And so we felt we were in good anatomic positioning. And also with the limited echo that we did during the procedure, we did not, we ruled out any type of um, low native uh, pulse tility or ongoing shock in terms of the EF function. But in hindsight, what we believe that was happening was with the placement of the impella, it was probably creating a um, wide open aortic regurgitation that was causing that uh, motor current to be flattened and no uh, pulsatility difference there. Unfortunately, we, by that time, it was kind of already spiraled to too late. The patient was already unwell enough that we decided to abort the procedure. So perhaps if we had had that in the differential prior to and taken it back into the aorta and trying to reposition, we could have avoided this and had the procedure ongoing. But I'd like to hear the panels and everyone else's thoughts on what they would have done differently. Thank you. That's an interesting case. As you were presenting it, I was thinking it was a aortic regurgitation. It's, you know, the bioprosthetic valves are much more prone to developed significant aortic uh, regurgitation with anything across it than a, than a native valve would, would be. I don't, I don't know that that would be solvable by repositioning. I think it's a, a physical a space issue mm -hmm. as opposed to biasing that you can, you can solve. But okay. um, uh, the, um, uh, and the patient, the tip off was you pulled it back and the, and the patient got, got better. Uh, yeah. But doing a, another uh, operation in this patient uh, was, a, was a high risk undertaking. And I, th I wondered if, uh, uh, if there wasn't a room for kind of uh, doing uh, uh, ECMO supported PCI uh, for her. Um, did you give some thought to that or? Um, at our facility as well as in terms of the other case presenter, we don't have ECMO support. Um, so that would have been a case of, you know, we did discuss with the patient about should we try use of the impella again, um, but given how poorly she did do and the amount of impella that we place our institution, we did not go that route. Um, but yes, that could have been a consideration if that's a technology that we did have. In terms of the repositioning, we did try repositioning within the LV, but we, what we did not do is we did not pull it out all the way into the aorta and try like a full repositioning, which I don't know if that could have made a difference as well in terms of how it crossed the aortic valve. We don't, you know, we don't use a lot of tandem heart at our institution, but this might have been a, a nice case for uh, tandem heart supported uh, high risk PCI just to avoid that valve complex completely. Um, you know, on the issue of AI, you wonder whether it was valvular or whether one of the leaflets were just being partially everted um, as you're coming across it. If it was something that was just sort of dumb luck, you could 
you know, never do it twice if you wanted to, it might have been worth uh, looking at it. But I think at that point, if you had the luxury of a little bit of time, you might have gotten some information with TEE. You could innovate her and just do TEE with the device across it to try to figure out what the mechanism of, uh, of the AI is, and if in fact, you know, that's solvable with, re, uh, with repositioning. Um, our third PHP case, when we were doing PHP cases for the trial, our third PHP case, uh, we came across the valve with the PHP, we opened up to 24 French, and there was just torrential AI, and I think we were just recirculating, you know. Um, and so as we get into more transvalvular uh, axial flow pumps, uh, depending on the configuration of the shaft and, you know, the angle of engagement and so forth, and as you get into bigger devices like PHP, it goes across 14, opens up to 23, 24 French, I think, you know, this may be sort of a recurrent issue. Yeah, right. I, think, I think the idea of uh, image guidance as the device is being put in, because then you're going to get the, you know, the color artifact from the microaxial flow. So it'll make it challenging. It would be challenging to diagnose AI once it's already in. But I, I, th I think the idea of a perspective protocol with these bioprosthesis to understand the mechanism of AI and, and where the device, I think, is, is, is a nice comment. We're, we're not doing that routinely, but I think there's an opportunity to better uh, understand that physiology. So I think in this case, everything was about device selection. Obviously, you didn't have access to ECMO at your center. Uh, tandem heart, like uh, Dr. Nathan mentioned, would have been an option, or maybe just stopping at that point and considering transfer to another center where they have the ability to do tandem heart or ECMO-supported PCI versus going for a high-risk redo cabbage in this patient. Uh, so that would be something to consider. Um, like Dr. Estep mentioned, I think diagnosing acute AI in the setting of an impella with the artifact that you see from the flow coming above the aortic valve, it's really hard to differentiate. Is this the flow dynamics of the impella versus is this acute AI on top of it? And I think in this case, uh, the way you guys manipulated the impella and you notice that every time you pull the impella back, the uh, the numbers got better, so that clearly told you that something was going on with AI. You just had no objective way to prove it. One other thing that could have been done would have been to maybe place a pigtail catheter in the aorta and just inject some dye at that point. And if you would see wide open AI at that point, you knew that that would be the you know the mechanism here. Clinically, it's really always hard to differentiate acute AI. Uh, echo also, like we said, even with TE, there's always issues with the aliasing that you see. Transthoracic, you may not even you know, see a good Doppler jet. So there's all these challenges that come with acute AI, especially with an impella at the same time. So maybe a pigtail would have helped, and maybe just stopping and considering transfer to another center. Just, I mean, a great presentation, thanks a lot. And it's always easy to discuss the case later, right? But if I see the angio and you had, had an FFR wire in it already, just put the stand in it, the osteal stand, it would have taken 30 seconds. Mm. And actually, what is actually high-risk PCI? That word just came up after we got devices to treat. So as you know, in Europe, we, we don't have that term. I, I would have treated that easily in my institution without any device. No ECMO, no Impella, no nothing. And most probably, I mean, the F wasn't that bad. As you said, it was 45. I don't think that was a high-risk case at all. Mm -hmm. but, but I see your discussion in it, mm -hmm. obviously. There was some concern for uh, calcification and the requirement for a rotoblader. Um, and uh, the, can you refresh for me, what were the right heart cath findings at the? So that is one area where we did not do a right heart cath. And in hindsight, I feel that, you know, that should, that would have been very helpful, especially yeah. like given after we had taken out the impella before bringing her down in the ICU, given our hospital course, that would have been something that could have been beneficial for her care. Right, because many of the, the, it can be a knee-jerk uh, response to want to put an impella for uh, high-risk supported PCI, but the, your right heart cath is really your valuable mm -hmm. tool to assess, are they really uh, high-risk patients? What's the uh, risk of hemodynamic deterioration? And can, as our German colleague suggested, could we have just gone ahead with uh, PCI in a more normative fashion? Right. And, it, and it's a very good way to be disciplined, meticulous, and systematic in terms of, uh, of assessing risk, because certainly the repeat uh, uh, operation was a high-risk mm -hmm. undertaking. So you just have to keep that in mind as you review your options. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.